All righty. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brady Worger. I am currently the chair for the Iowa DD Council. I would like to welcome each and every one of you this morning to our March Capital Chat. Uh, we have a pretty busy, busy agenda today, so I'm going to keep it short and sweet, but just want to welcome everybody, and I hope everybody um, has a safe day with the uh, severe weather moving in. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Amy to get us started. Thanks, Brady. Actually, I'm going to just toss it back over a quick. Uh, oh, I was going to use a basketball term, but I, I can't remember it now that since we have, we're in the final four tonight, but uh, I botched that. I'm going to hand it over to Carlin and Brooke to introduce Lisa. And I'm going to hand it over to Brooke to introduce <laughs> you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> oh, we're having a Friday today, aren't we? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Brooke Lovelace. I'm the director of the DD Council. Um, and we are excited to have Lisa Cook here today to talk a little bit about the HCBS evaluation um, project that's going on and what the next steps are. And so we're going to hand the baton over one more time and uh, turn it over to Lisa Cook, who is with HHS. Hi. Um, I, you know, the, the introduction really made me think of basketball, just passing the ball from person to person. Um, and I am really excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, and uh, I think it should be visible. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Iowa Community-Based Service Transformation Plan. Um, I want to start with a few thank yous. Um, thank you so much for having me today, on today. Um, I was able to talk with um, the Director of the Division of Behavioral Health and Disability Services, Marissa Ianson, um, and also the Director of Medicaid, um, Liz Matney, um, and they both told me about um, the work that your group does, and um, we are just really thankful to have um, have your attention and your time today. Um, I also uh, want to thank the Mathematica team. We contracted um, the evaluation that happened in 2023, and also um, the transformation plan that I'll be talking with you about today. Um, and, uh, and so you'll see the Mathematica sign on a number of slides and it's because we, we had help with doing a lot of this work. Um, and then uh, lastly, we have a steering committee for community-based service evaluation and transformation work that has really been instrumental in um, in creating some of these concepts and, and, and informing our next steps. It takes a village, it truly does. Um, <clears throat> so uh, on this slide, I have a picture of our transformation plan. And um, what the transformation plan is, is it's an action plan to implement recommendations from the community-based service evaluation um, that was completed in early 2023. Um, but the work toward for that evaluation really happened um, over the last year. Um, the transformation plan uh, was developed using community-based service evaluation guiding principles those are equitable access, high quality services, um, coordination across systems, uh, demonstrating value for Iowans, um, and also just um, the guiding value of um, working effectively and with accountability. Um, so the goals of the transformation plan um, were, were developed using those guiding principles. Um, I'll be talking through them more in depth, but the goals are developing a streamlined screening process, aligning community-based services, and also maximizing um, support for people with long-term service and support needs. Um, 
I do want to just take a minute to talk about the active implementation framework. So an active implementation framework um, goes from exploration to full implementation um, with uh, active contribution and refinement along the way. So we start in an exploration phase first where we're discovering and defining, and then we move to installation and then initial implementation and full implementation. Um, today, I have three key takeaways for you. The first is how Iowa can improve community integration. Um, so I'm gonna dig into what implementing streamlined screening and processes looks like, um, how we can align services to need, and how we can maximize access to supports. The next big takeaway I have is that the implementation team will be leveraging expertise of partners and members to create solutions. And the last key takeaway is that implementation activities require accountability. So I'll be talking a little bit about that too. Okay, so key takeaway number one, how Iowa can improve community integration through streamlined screening and processes, aligning services to needs and maximizing access to supports. So how do we do it? <laughs> um, I'm gonna show the transformation plan as I cover each of these topics or these goals, um, just to give you that visual of the next three activities that I'm gonna be talking through are these yellow boxes um, that are enclosed in that kind of bigger box um, towards the goal of developing the streamlined um, screening and processes to better, better serve people. Um, so the first activity that we'll be undertaking is conducting a point in time screening. Um, the reason we need to do this is because we are missing information about the needs of people on wait lists in order to refer or connect them for services. Um, what this looks like is conducting a screening of all people on the wait list to assess need. The second activity we'll be undertaking is improving wait list policy and procedure. Um, we know we need to do this because wait lists are not targeted to support those most in need of community-based services. And how we'll do this is through developing policies and procedures that define prioritization criteria. And the last activity we'll be working towards is developing a data architecture. Um, the reason we need to do this is that there is not a process for connecting people to services or collecting that information about need. Um, and what that will look like is developing data systems that can support new waitlist screening and procedures. The next goal I'm going to be talking about is aligning community-based services to Iowans' needs. We will do this through three activities. Um, the first is developing waiver service packages um, that meet um, meet the needs of Iowans. We know we need to do this because the waiver structure is currently based on diagnosis and it's not adequate to meeting people's needs. How we'll do this is through identifying a package of services that people need to remain in the community. The second activity will be conducting a financial analysis to maximize dollars in the system. Um, the reason we need to do this is that there are limited resources to serve people and the funding streams lack coordination currently. So how we'll do this is through assessing financial benefits and trade-offs of changes to the system and also identifying opportunities for alignment. The last activity for this alignment work is developing a uniform assessment tool. The reason we need to do this is because current use of multiple assessment tools does not allow for measuring needs across different waiver populations. And how we'll do this is through identifying and preparing to launch a universal assessment tool and process. 
All right, so moving into this last goal of maximizing access to services, um, we'll, we'll dig into the activities that we have in the bottom right of the screen shown. So the first way that we'll be maximizing access to services is through improving system navigation. The activities that we'll be undertaking are creating resources for system navigation. Um, and we know we need to do that because consumers do not have easy access to accurate information about services. What that looks like is identifying tools and resources to improve the content and availability of information about services. And next, we will develop system navigation staff. We know that we need to do this because consumers currently do not have easy access to accurate information about services. Um, and what that will look like is creating a system navigator position to help people navigate the community-based service system. Uh, the next way that we'll be maximizing access to services is through case management. Um, the first activity we'll undertake for case management is training and certifying case managers. Um, we know we need to do this because case management does not always connect people to the needed services or help with transitions. Um, and what this will look like is implementing training programs for case managers to ensure consistency and quality. The next activity will be setting case management to member ratios. And the reason we need to do this is um, case managers are not always available to support members when needs arise. Um, and what this will look like is identifying and establishing case, case management to member ratios. So now that we've talked about the what, I wanna talk a little bit about how, um, and that gets us to takeaway two, leveraging the ex expertise among partners and members to create solutions. Um, it is so important to be hearing from members and caregivers throughout this process. Um, we know we need to collect ideas and feedback through conversation. Um, we know that we need to identify and explore solutions for system improvement. And so we're creating opportunities for engagement. Um, we uh, will be hosting focus groups and listening sessions, as well as work groups um, and also conducting interviews. Um, also along this, this line of um, of working together towards uh, this system change is supporting a steering committee. Um, and we know steering committees are, are really important to provide input about activities and proposed changes, and also um, super important in considering how changes will impact people who use services. Um, so we, we will have on that steering committee, people who use community-based services, caregivers of people who use community-based services, and also community-based service providers. Um, part of the design approach is being clear about how, how we're working together to co-create solutions. Um, I really love the slide and this graphic um, because it, it provides a great visual of how the work is gonna progress. So right now we are um, all the way on the left side in that discovery phase um, where we, we know what we need to do, but we need to design the right things. Um, so from this place of, of having a challenge, um, we will be broadening our perspective um, to see what is needed. Um, and then taking um, perspective and feedback and contributions from the people listed on this slide, our invested Iowans, our steering committee, 
our health and human services team will define the opportunity. And that closes out the, that first diamond. Um, and then we'll do a similar approach for designing things right, um, where we will branch out to gather a lot of ideas um, on how we can do that, and then really refining to what, what needs to be delivered as a proposed solution. And it's important that we have um, invested Iowans really contributing um, as we move, move through both phases of um, designing the right things and designing things right. Um, communication channels to share information um, will be uh, an FAQ and summary document, um, town hall and office hours, newsletters, um, website updates, and also email updates. Um, we just this week uh, refreshed our community-based service redesign website too. It's on the HHS um, uh, home site. So um, I have a link to that um, in the slides and I'll pop that into the chat too once I'm out of the presenter mode. Um, but we, we really want to engage um, and uh, provide lots of opportunity for that to happen. Um, so takeaway three, accountability. Um, we know implementation is gonna require accountability and, and this is how we wanna do that. Um, we, uh, we want to gauge strategic learning. So we want to see the extent to which activities are demonstrating progress. Uh, we want to see systems change. So we want to measure the extent to which activities change the system. And lastly, we want to see mission outcomes. We want to measure the extent to which activities help to make lives better. Um, and how we are going to um, be measuring that is through defining our measures, identifying the data sources and reporting methods, um, for those measures, um, conducting regular analysis and reports um, to assess how we are progressing and um, implement program improvement changes. Um, so I wanna thank you all again for your time and um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, what, what you're most excited about, what you want to share, um, just your gut reaction. Um, and uh, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Brooke, this is Brady. Are we uh, taking questions now? Yeah, I think we can take some questions now. Okay, I'm looking uh, in the chat. I don't see anything yet. Um, Lisa, I, I I can start off with a question. So, what kind of is the time frame? I mean, when do you see this? When you talk about that that uh, graphic that you like, I mean, what what it's starting now? When do you see it ending? I mean, granted, there's always going to be changes that need to happen, but what's kind of the time frame? That's a really great question, um, and. The discovery work is is starting now, so we are in that that first part. Um, I I think that that double diamond graphic is for our exploration phase, where we are understanding what needs to be um, uh, done and also what our opportunities are, um, and exploration for for most of the work we think can be completed this calendar year. Um, a more detailed um, uh, timeline is on that CBS redesign website 
notes and I'm looking to pop into the chat here in just a second, but it has each of those activities um, connected to a timeline over the next two calendar years. Any other questions from folks? I do see in the chat um, the question for a link to this PowerPoint. Um, I, I will share that with you. I'm still working with uh, the communications team on, on getting it formatted in a, uh, so it's easily shared. Thanks, and we'll include that in our recording too when we send out the recording for it. I have a question, Brooke. It's Kelly from London. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Um, Lisa, can you talk a little bit? And I joined about three minutes late, so you may have um, talked about this a little bit, but I am um, just curious about the funding of this project and what is the commitment to um, the funding issues that may be unveiled or not unveiled? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, so year one of the project, the evaluation um, was funded through the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and uh, year two is as well. Um, I think that American Rescue Plan Act funding ends in April of 2024, um, but in calendar year 2023, um, one of the activities is a financial analysis where we will really be um, digging into uh, what the funding streams are and um, what the realignment or that's probably not the right word, um, but what uh, a community-based service redesign, what that funding need is and where the resources um, are best placed. Um, this is Amy Dessenberg Goins. I just have a quick question. Thank you, Lisa, so much for the presentation. I was just curious, is there a way for folks to actually see the plan that you referenced? Is that available? Yes, I, I can put that in the chat too. Thank you. Lisa, hi, this is um, Carlin Crow from the DD Council. Just a um, quick question might be kind of a comment too. Um, the slide, I, I really like the slide where you were talking about measuring outcomes and that, um, you know, the, the desired outcome is to improve lives. And I'm just um, hoping and asking, I guess, also um, how, you know, we can help convey that to members and um, you know, people that, that we work with, uh, other organizations on this call work with that, you know, the whole idea of the um, redesign, <laughs> as you said, is to, you know, improve what we're doing and improve lives. And I really believe that that's where Medicaid is coming from this and, and, and want to um, reinforce that. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, if there's more of like a public awareness campaign or anything planned where, you know, some of those like simple messages are going to be communicated. Yes, um, that, and that is the heart, um, is really improving, improving lives. Um, and uh, there, yes, we, <laughs> we want to uh, really hear about how um uh how we can best do that um we have a twitter account and a facebook account and an interest form um those are all places where um we can collect thoughts or where you can share thoughts about um how 
uh, how you are understanding the effort and the progress. Um, I think that was the main question was how do, how do we people engage? Um, lots of opportunities. Uh, Brady, you want to go ahead with your question, and then we might need to turn it over to Amy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I have lived with services since 2018 for community-based services and home community-based services. Um, and, you know, serving on the council since 2019, I have been able to experience the struggles that not only the state of Iowa has, but just in all with holding community-based services and um, basically the waiting list for holding community-based services. Um, a lot of us are aware that there's individuals that are applying to be put on the 8CBS community-based services waiting list, and they're waiting, I mean, two to three years to get approved. Um, <sighs> You know, I, I, we had a capital day not that long ago at the Capitol, and I brought up with a couple of people where, you know, and I don't know if we can look into this as the future kind of keeps going on, but um, I would like to see people advocate for some sort of a, a way so when people are applying for a waiting list, especially with the home and community based services, you know, sometimes they wait two to three years and they find out, oh, you don't qualify. Um, so how can we make that more affordable or more reliable to people that are applying for services so that people don't get turned away from services? Yeah, thank you, Brady. And I think that's the whole process. That's what that whole number one that she talked about, Brady, was to try and make that process easier so that people are getting the services they need and are not waiting on waiting lists. Right. Yep. And I agree. And I appreciate your hard work, Lisa, with all this because it's a concerning issue, not just here in the state, but everywhere. And it just, it's not fair to people with disabilities that they can't get the services they need. So I really applaud your work and your department's work on what they're doing. Um, I think we've got one more question and then I do think we need to turn it over to Amy if she is, I think she's still with us. Um, and I don't know, Lisa, if you see the chat about, it's a question Leah has about if they're thinking about moving case management away from the MCOs, if that might be part of the process, if that has been talked No, that that is not, um, the defined um, effort. I think it's um, the truly the focus of case manage the case management work is identifying um, training needs and ratio needs um, and some standardization there. But I I certainly. Um, appreciate that you're you're sharing that perspective. All right, thanks so much, Lisa, for joining. This is such great information. Um, and we'll you know we'll probably have you back as you know throughout the, the, the coming year when as things progress and um, if you need help identifying people to be on that steering committee, um, please uh, the council can help you with that. Um, just let us know how we can be of service to you guys too as you move forward. Yes, and I'm going to put that um, the interest form in the chat too. If you if you already know you want to contribute, um, thank you. Uh, we we want your help. All right, see you later. Thank you so much again, and um, I will capture that interest form link as well and put it in our um, our next newsletter that's coming out, um, the print version, the longer version will be coming out here 
um, in the next week. It will be online next week, but um, won't hit your mailboxes till whenever the post office gets gets that um, delivery done. So I am going to share my screen. Again, I'm Amy Campbell. I work with um, the Iowa Developmental Disabilities Council with Brooke and um, Carlin. And Carlin and I did not really organize this. So we'll go kind of back and forth um, as soon as I can get my screen share here. Why is it not? I was doing it earlier. Okay, here we go. So I, hopefully, do you see the screen share now? I can't see you guys, so. Yeah. No one... Okay, good. Somehow my setup doesn't let me kind of do that. Um, see if I can get it moving forward. Hello. Yeah, every time this happens, right? Okay, it's my... I guess my computer's just slow today. <laughs> so it's a Friday, it's a funnel Friday. So this week was the final funnel deadline. So that means that um, bills virtually had to get out of committee. There, There is literally no more committee work unless it's um, the budget committee, which is appropriations or the ways and means committee, which does taxes. All the other committees are done. Um, their state government might meet to approve the governor's um, nominees for various boards and commissions, but really all of their work is done for the year. Um, I can't believe April Fool's Day is tomorrow. <laughs> so um, it's um, April, it starts tomorrow and that is the last month of session. Um, the last Friday in April is the final paid day. So we really are down to the last four or five weeks of session um, here. Um, so there's a lot to get done. I put up this chart, you've seen it before in some of our publications, but um, it's the, it's, I call it the shoots and ladders because my kids are still a little bit young enough that I wasn't that long ago we were playing shoots and ladders, but um, it's the process that moves through the legislative, uh, that a bill moves through. So you can see to stay alive after today, which they're not meeting today. So the funnel was virtually yesterday. Um, you have to have been voted out of either the House or the Senate and then out of committee on the other side. So um, really all there's left to do is floor work, which is floor debate where they pull up a bill to talk about it and pass it. So we wanted to go really quickly through um, kind of where, what bills um, made it through. Ah, now it wants to go fast, right? Um, and so if you guys saw the capital snapshot that um, Carolyn did, Two, three, two or three weeks ago, um, she kind of organized bills and the good, the bad, the confusing, the disappointing. So I kind of stayed with it on that and some of the bills that she was highlighting there. So I'm going to start with the good bills that we've been tracking that we really wanted to see keep moving through the process. And you can see we've got about half and a half, <laughs> about a little over half made it through. Um, the first one we know we've had some council members and others um, working on for many years is a bill that requires schools to have trained staff in the identification of seizures and um, the response and administration of um, medications. So that bill made it through. It's House File 608 and the Senate is ready to debate, debate it. The other one is the what they call the medical non-medical switching bill, which means um, it's a weird word for it, but it basically means your insurance company cannot switch your prescription drug coverage if you're stable on that drug. So they can't say, oh, you have to do something, this cheaper drug, or they can't just remove it from their, their list of drugs that they cover um, if, you're, if you're doing well on that bill. It, there has to really be a medical reason to switch you. So that bill has gone pretty far. It's probably gone this far before. It's just um, always gets stuck on that Senate um, Senate debate. So that's House File 626. Um, so we're hoping maybe that has a shot this year. Um, House File 378 is still alive, although it hasn't moved since it was introduced. It's in the Appropriations Committee, so it is not subject to the funnels. And that um, creates automatic annual increases in the Medicaid reimbursement. Um, those of you that have heard some of the DHS um, presentations or maybe you've been on the town halls that they host monthly, 
um, they've been pretty clear that they want to get to that point where they have an ongoing regular review of rates and a, and a more um, that there be an annual adjustments so that they're don't get so far behind um, like we're at that situation now. So I don't think that bill is going to move, but it is still very much being discussed in when you talk about budgets. Um, another exciting piece is the bill that gets rid of income tax on direct support professional wages. So they would no longer pay income tax on their wages as a, a way to maybe encourage more people to do that versus going and getting a job at Target or something, which um, can sometimes pay better. Um, that bill, Senate File 7, hasn't moved, but we have a subcommittee, and you can see in the little orange box there, a subcommittee set on at noon on Monday um, for House File 264, so that they are going to um, have a subcommittee on it. I don't know if it's going to go much further than that, but you can join by phone or by um, uh online to watch that. You can't participate in that unless you show up at the Capitol, but you can watch the, the um, discussion. And I know that um, um, several groups are gonna be there. And I think Link Associates is gonna be there to talk about it too. Um, then also we kind of talked a little bit about the bill that's got a lot of different things for, um, for the Department of Health and Human Services, but it expands the stakeholder input in the MHDS regional governing boards. So there would be providers would have a vote on that and there'd be a more balance, uh, there'd be more balance to those governing boards. They wouldn't be so heavily um, county supervisor. So that bill has made it through as well. It also adds community-based um, competency, competency restoration. So people that are um, needing to have competency restored for trial, um, those uh, people that are justice involved or maybe in the jail, um, that that would become a regional service. The the things that didn't make it, and we're pretty sad about this, um, I'll pause at the end of this list, um, Carlin, if you want to say anything about some of those, but we were really hopeful that the new college-based um, transition scholarship program for uh, young adults with disabilities would pass House File 252, but it did not make it out of a Senate committee. Um, we've heard the Senate and the House are fighting about things unrelated to that and that they ended up killing each other's bills. <laughs> but um, this didn't have any money in it and it needs to have money in it to give scholarships. So um, we're hopeful that maybe that might be discussed in the education budget still, um, even though that bill didn't move forward on its own. Um, so that's something we might um, you might think about working on, um, talking to your legislators about getting that in the education budget, if that is something that you um, are interested in. And I know Carlin's son's in that one of the programs at the University of Iowa and um, can talk about the um, how great those programs are. Um, the, the bill that would have aligned the home and community-based um, uh, uh, ID waiver, um, the, the caps on the home and vehicle modifications with the brain injury waiver, um, brain injury had an annual cap that was um, over $6,000, and the ID waiver had a total lifetime cap of under $6,000, so this would have moved it up to having that same um, waiver, annual waiver cap, so there would be more ability to do home and vehicle modifications on an ongoing basis. Um, that didn't make it, but again, that's a really good one that would have had to have gone through the budget process anyway, because that costs money. So it was only $700,000 that they estimated. So it is like, it is not that much money if that's something that is important to you. I think that's a really good piece to advocate for, for, um, for, for the budget process. And then we had two autism related bills that did not make it. The bill that would have um, ended all of the insurance limits on aut autism treatment um, did not make it through House File 243. And then the bill that would have required schools to excuse absences for kids getting autism treatment. Um, there was some con concern that maybe that was only happening in the Eastern side of the state and it wasn't happening throughout. So again, if that's something that is important to you and you don't happen to live in Dubuque where they think it's all happening, um, I think legislators need to understand that. So before I move on to the next 
Um, Carlin, did you want to add anything to that? Um, just that, yeah, we were disappointed because the these um, failures, so to speak, that Amy mentioned were ones that we have been working on and providing testimony. Um, and so it is disappointing, but the good news is that they are still alive to be debated next year. So we will work on them again. And as Amy said, there might be some, you know, um, other things that could be done for them to be brought up in um, appropriations if, if possible this year. But I, she, she knows that more, that side more than I do. So um, if not, then we will, you know, definitely be working on these again next year. And can gather more information and input and do more advocacy on them. Yes, Thanks I, that's, Amy. that's a good point um, because they do, see if I can go back to that. Um, they start back right here in the committee where they're ended. So they don't have to start back up here at the bill request and the idea process. They start next year right where they ended, which is right over here where it says March 31st. So, I mean, that is, um, good news because they all at least made it through the House and over into the Senate. So I'm um, going to talk about the bad. <laughs> um, I think uniformly 26 or seven different organizations, Iowa-based organizations, oppose the, the two bills that require um, a new level of household asset testing for public benefit programs, which includes Medicaid, it includes the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP, which is the Food Assistance Program, and also the Children's Health Insurance Program. So um, the they would now create a new type of test to make sure that you don't have too many, you don't own too many expensive things uh, that would disqualify you from those programs. And so, um, they are going to test against the whole household. So parents of kids that are on the children's health insurance program or um, parents of kids who are on the children's mental health waiver, um, all very concerning to a lot of um, different organizations. And um, honestly, the, nothing seems to be stopping these bills. So the House um, Democrats requested a public hearing on this. So they've set it for Tuesday. April 4th at 9.30 a.m. And that's the link there. If you do want to speak, you have to do it in person and it has to be, you have to sign up for it and you'll probably get two minutes. Um, but you do have to sign up. So I encourage you to do that right away afterwards if you would like to speak about this bill um, at the Capitol um, because it'll, it'll fill up pretty fast and I bet they're only going to plan an hour or two. So um, you can also submit written comments and they do read them um, and sometimes the press sees them. So I will acknowledge that those are public comments. Um, so they will be seen. Um, you can do that um, with that link there as well. Um, you can also get the details, the link to watch um, or listen in if you would like to, to do that as well. Um, so that's, um, you'll have that ability to get those links there and sign up. I encourage people um, who have personal experience and nervousness about this to speak. I mean, they do hear from providers, but sometimes um, family members and individuals, it, it makes a bigger difference. And that is on the Senate file. So that the Senate file only has these asset tests and identity verification. So you have to kind of if you have a credit card or a bank, you know, you have to know like mother's maiden name or last, you know, they have a couple questions that identify who you are. That's what you would have to set up. They have made it so that you can do it with somebody else. So somebody can do that on your behalf for you. If you don't have a computer or something that would make it um, easy, it might be a case manager, it might be somebody that provides your services. It could be your parents um, or if it, friend um, help you do that. The House bill, so the Senate bill has passed the Senate and is out of committee in the House. So it's on, it's ready for House debate. The, the House bill is still in the House Appropriations Committee. And that also includes the, people call it work requirements, but it's really, they called it community engagement. So you can either work or go to school or volunteer in the community for, I think it's 20 hours. I can't remember now the threshold, but it's a, it's not a full-time amount. Um, 
and from what we hear, most people do work. It's a matter of whether you would um, or are engaged. Um, it's a matter of whether you would somebody would have the ability to provide the proof that they're doing that um, and do that on a regular basis so they're not kicked off their benefits. Um, one of the failures, which I guess is a good thing if it's a bad bill <laughs> that failed, is a bill that would have allowed healthcare providers and professionals to refuse service to somebody because they don't agree with them on moral or ethical grounds. Um, Senate File 297, that was probably, as you might suspect, more related to the LGBTQ transgender issues or um, abortion reproductive issues, but it was written very broadly that it could really be for any reason somebody could refuse service on moral grounds. Um, so that bill did not make it through. I'm gonna move on to the confusing unless um, Carlin or Brooke, do you have any more to add? Can I just add one thing about the public assistance? So um, I do encourage you to go make comments on that link. The, the hearing is only one hour. And um, if you go to the link and, and um, it looks like you need to come to the meeting to make comments and you don't. So you can leave your comments there. Um, one thing that you know might be an important message after what we've heard from Lisa Cook is that um, you know there these both of these bills are proposing changes to um, Medicaid and how um, people are um, assessed, how a household is assessed, and and for new applicants um, who um, you know may be. Um, who be, may be able to apply and get Medicaid and be on a waiver. Um, and as you heard from Lisa, there's a lot of changes going on right now um, in the Medicaid program that, you know, we hope will be good changes. And one thing, you know, they're looking at is how the application process works and ways that can make it better. So I wonder if, you know, some of our messaging will be, you know, why, why can't we hold off on this at least, you know, for a year and look at some of those um, changes that the program is trying to make before, you know, these decisions are hastily run through, which they are being very hastily um, run through in these bills. Um, and what we hear from proponents of this bill is that they're going to create, you know, one system for applicants to go through and, you know, everything will be nice and easy and smooth for any public assistance that someone may try to apply for. And it, it's going to be a you know, new, easy way to look at um, who's eligible, eligible and who's not. And, you know, if that's the case, then fine, let's put in a system that will do that, but let's not at the same time kick people off of these programs who may still be eligible because of all of the other um, parts of this, these packages that just um, aren't very well thought out um, in my humble opinion. Thanks, Carlin. Um, quickly through the confusing and the disappointing, um, there were a couple bills that did survive. They're confusing, but um, this first one is a one we're going to want to see passed, it's taxing the managed care organizations, but they're doing it. It's kind of a shell game, but they're basically taxing it, then matching it with federal dollars and then giving them their money back, but keeping the federal match. So it will raise $100 million a year for Medicaid. So that is great news because <laughs> it's not involving tax dollars. It's using existing um, money from the MCOs and they're held, they're made whole. So they're not going to try to take it from someone else. Um, so it is just literally a way to get additional federal money into the system. So I know legislators are looking at that and thinking it won't happen this next year, but it'll happen the following year that they'll have those dollars. Um, they're really thinking about that for the home and community-based um, transition from Glenwood um, and increasing rates for providers um, using those dollars. So, um, and then there's a chance to draw down a little bit of extra federal dollars on that too, if they do increase rates. So I think that is something we all wanna see happen. Um, it is safe from the funnel. Um, some of you may have been um, seeing this bill that defines brain health as being the same as mental health and behavioral health and um, brain injury and all of this, it's gotten confusing because 
of the way the bill is drafted. Um, what it's intended to do is in, get rid of stigma for people with mental health conditions. And so that bill is alive, but I don't think it'll survive unless there's an amendment that um, makes it so that it's not confusing who pays for what. Because when you say it all equals the same, then you start dealing with different funding streams and how that's gonna be paid for. So it's a confusing bill. Um, there were a couple that um, didn't make it through that we also kind of linked in the confusing piece. Um, the guardians and conservator bill that we've spent a lot of time in these capital chats talking about did not make it through. Um, and it didn't make it through because the House Judiciary Committee got mad at the Senate and they just canceled their meeting. They had it planned to come out of committee and um, it, they just canceled the meeting. So it's dead. Um, it did not die because people were concerned about it. It died because of something completely unrelated to it. They just got in a fight. And so Senate file 295 will start again in the House committee next year. Um, and um, I think everyone was pretty much now, I think, on the same page with um, the compromise, which requires everyone to use those same forms that give good information to the courts to make sure that protected persons are indeed protected. Um, Senate file 295 is a bill that was also confusing. It died. Um, and this, I think, is a good thing. It was, it basically said health insurance companies have to follow the public policy that the state fate sets. So if the state decides it's not legal to pay for a um, young person's um, gender treatment, um, then the insurance company couldn't pay for that if they went out of state to do that. It was, um, but it, again, it was like that other bill. It was very broad. It didn't really say what public policies. So that was, I think, because it was so vague and confusing, it just um, couldn't, couldn't pass, which um, is, I think everyone thought was a good thing that it died. The other bill we did talk about is a bill that eliminated a lot of um, health and human services um, department boards and commissions, including the Brain Injury Advisory Council, um, the Children's Behavioral Health Board, um, it ended all of the, the, the payments that they give citizen members of these commissions to be able to drive in to, to meet, but it also required that the meetings be virtual so you could have the option to do it like we're doing right now. Um, that bill didn't make it, um, but I have heard that's something that may be coming back around next year with the department um, as well. Really quickly, the disappointing um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the re state government reorganization bill is at the governor's desk. It hasn't been signed yet. Um, Carlin put that in the disappointing because it was the parts that were concerning around voc re re vocational rehabilitation, the department of the blind, um, the de deaf school, the school for the deaf and the blind and sight saving school. Um, none of them had any input into the discussions and changes that were made um, prior to that. And then, um, Carlin, I don't know if you want to say anything about House File 604. That is a bill that we've been very concerned about with Disability Rights Iowa that would allow the removal of disruptive students from a classroom. And then if, and it doesn't define disruptive, um, I've heard they might be changing that to violent students, but they do not exempt children who are on an IEP, Individualized Education Plan, and after three times being removed in a, in a semester, the um, student would be expelled, which has major concerns among family members to understand what this would mean to their children. Um, and so that bill um, has survived, and I think there will be an amendment on it. Hey, Amy, I hate to interrupt you, but we really only have the interpreter for four more minutes. So if we could cover what we think we need to cover. So I don't know if we have chance, time for people to ask questions then after that. Yep. I just wanted to mention that we um, do have budgets uh, targets. So these were in our report last week. So you can refer back to that. It's on our website, iowadddcouncil.org. Um, and so those numbers there, as you see, 
I'm just what I'd like to point out is they're not spending all the money they have. They over, have over a billion dollars more that they could spend. And I think you all might have some ideas on how they could spend that. So don't let them tell you that there's no money. I just want to say that. Um, yeah, there's the there's the math. I'm not good at math, but that's good math. <laughs> and um, there is a um, the shell bills are now out on the Senate for um, they don't have any dollars in them. So I would just say. Um, we will have this PowerPoint up on our website and you can take a look at these if you are interested in how the budgets, they've reorganized them so that they follow the governor's reorganization. So um, shout out to the Systems Unlimited people who were at the Capitol this week. They had a good Capitol day and I will just leave it as a call to action at the end that I think there's a lot of different ways that you can take action. We've mentioned some of them um, before, but um, please check out the local public forums that are in your area. Um, use our Take Action Center. And I, with that, you're right, we have three minutes. <laughs> I will turn it over. I know it was a lot, but we tried to cram in a lot um, here at the um, with the end of the funnel and all of the information going on with the waiver reform, so. Quick questions. Oh, yeah, questions. Probably have time for one. I know it's a lot, um, stay tuned. We will have a report out next week and um, if you haven't checked out the Capital Chat snapshots that Carlin and I have done, they're on our website as well. Um, and we will we will include the, her entire PowerPoint when we send out the recording that will probably go out Monday morning. Yes, mine and um, uh, Lisa's. Yes. So I, I guess I interrupted you. You had one more minute you could have spoken if people didn't have questions. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you guys, everyone. Survived the storm this afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Arthur.